I was going through keywords and I found like a few keywords that were like not hard to rank on, but was getting a lot of views. And uh, I put that keyword in in a different and I like, you know, everything that was relevant to it. And then for some reason, just over time, I was shocked when that video got so many views and like I still get sales for that beat. <laughs> Peace, what's going down? It's DJ Payne One for BeatStars.com in the spot with the infamous Beat Demons. What's going down? Yo. Chilling, chilling, bruh. Chilling, chilling, sipping, sipping. Hey. <laughs> All right, so on, on to the music. How long have uh, both of you been producing? Oh, man. I've been making beats since I was like 14. I'm 27 now, so it's been a while. Probably like a good eight years. And then how long have you been... Uh, selling beat licenses online. Three years? Yeah, about since 2016, right? Once we switched to Beat Stars after we heard all the stuff they had available, I mean, it was kind of like a no brainer. And then honestly, just uh, the player and everything just seemed to work better for us. So that's why we ended up staying there and we've seen ourselves increase um, just by switching. So, speaking of sales, how long did it take for you to actually start making sales? within that three year period of, of just starting to upload your beats online? I kind of had like people already in the town that like knew me personally. And then once they found that, I told them like, hey, we got a site. And I just never the site. We kind of like, it wasn't a lot of sales, but it was some sales, you know? And then we started investing in like promo and doing other stuff like that. And by the end of the year, you know, we were making a couple thousand. So, mm. I mean, it really just took a good year to make a couple thousand, but after that, it just took a little bit longer to start reaching to where it was like substantial enough to benefit two people. So how many beats do you upload every week now compared to when you first started? Has that number changed? It stayed the same, right? I think yeah, I yeah. think just back then it was just we didn't have our brand together and like the way to word stuff. And like I know when you first start off, you're like, oh, I'm going to send everybody to my social pages and all this other shit. And, like, you don't think, like, why don't you just direct all that traffic to your website? And I think that's what we were trying to figure out. But once we finally figured that out, you know, we started just sending all those, like, people to our site and building that fan base and email base that way. So just just to be clear, so you found sending customers straight to your website to be more beneficial in terms of converting sales than building up an Instagram following or focusing on how many facebook likes you got yeah i mean it was more just like the product just send them to the product i mean but it does help i think ultimately if you keep consistently uploading stuff on instagram youtube etc that alone itself would you know build up your fan base but i mean i wouldn't try to like build up your instagram with your youtube that you're trying to make money on you know what i'm saying like you got to try to direct traffic to your site and then from your site you'll have social media links if, if they care you know but uh ultimately i i just think sending them to your site is the best option over time your branding has has changed a lot especially in terms of your image and you spend mm -hmm. a lot of time developing a look for you know your instagram videos your youtube videos and, and developing a look for your beat uploads why mm -hmm. why was this so important I think just to give the overall concept of Beat Demons, and once you listen to something, once you see something, you're going to know, like, oh, that's Beat Demons, you know what I'm saying? And I think it just, you know, it helps, like, make your fan base remember you more, and, you know, and then the quality. Um, our, our Instagram, back then, we used to just screen record with our, uh, with our phone, you know what I'm oh, saying, yeah. just record with our phone, and the audio wasn't always that great. You know, you like the person watching didn't get the full effect of the video just because of the quality. And then, you know, we're potentially losing out on fans and customers, you know. So that's why we started, you know, recording with a good camera and then putting audio on the back of high quality and just lining everything up. And then that right there just ultimately just changed our Instagram. And we started getting hundreds of followers, thousands of likes, you know, that alone would just build your social so did you find that, you know, this new imaging, this higher quality imaging corresponded to, to more sales? Uh, Yeah. I mean, I, I've looked now. Instagram has like, a, you know, where you could check out analytics. 
and how many people from that post have went to your website. And, you know, from back then, I've noticed now that more people click the link on our website. Um, we get more emails. It tells you how many followers you get just off that post. You know, so I think that all I've noticed a big difference and we've jumped to like how many Instagram followers we starting to get like daily. So with all this video content and especially with all the, the graphics, you know, every single YouTube upload has a, a specific look. You have an artist with their eyes all white. They look demonic. Who, <laughs> yeah. who handles all the graphics? Who handles all the video editing? It's a lot of work, right? Uh, yeah, I handle all the graphics and all the editing and all the when I upload. I, I'm like real smart with like the SEO and how to like, you know, just send everything the right way and put everything. I, I do all that. It does take a little bit of time. But I mean, that's why you have to build a template. Um, like we have a YouTube template that I made and it's simple. You know, it didn't take that long, but I use that same template for every upload and I'll just change out the, the name and then the the thumbnail. But the thumbnails are probably the thing that does take the longest, though, just because I try to be creative and, you know, they can't just find that image on uh you know what is it called like google and stuff like that so i I'm, i edit it and try to make it unique to our brand i mean i think a lot of people underestimate how much work goes into building an online i, I know i certainly did when i first yeah, started it, i'm like there's no way this dude is spending all that time on photoshop there's no because a lot of people are looking for free tools and shortcuts and let me just get yeah. a thumbnail generator but you're doing this all manually you're doing the keyword mm -hmm. research all manually you're in photoshop making demonizing the look of of these images right yeah yeah i mean yeah that that's easy though i i guess it just comes all down to like the creativity of each person and me i back in the day i used to like mess around with photoshop so now it's like how i know fl studio i know photoshop you know i'm not like a beast at it but i'm decent enough to he, handle he everything quickly and efficiently <laughs> so when when you started making beats you know selling licenses online did you think that you were going to have to do all this graphic stuff and this marketing and seo stuff the seo no the graphics i had a, a idea like you know you have to present yourself professionally but uh i didn't think it would be to the point to what i'm doing now so, I mean, I, I just think as you go, you start to progress in different things and you start to learn like, hey, this is what I should do and this is what I need to be doing, you know, and just trying to keep up with, not keep up with everybody, but trying to stay ahead really of like, you know, the quality and how we present ourselves, I think plays a big difference. Now with YouTube, I went back to your first upload. Um, Zay, well, the first couple of uploads, right? I got to, I had to do my research and they were all getting around, you know, 500 to 1,000 views. And then suddenly there's this video that just hit, I think five, six figures. And now you're up to, to millions and millions of views. What do you think changed with your YouTube strategy? It was weird because I know there was this one video and it might be one of the first one that you actually probably seen. It was like a little boozy beat. Mm. Was it? Did you see yeah. that one? Yeah. Yep. It was. I don't know. With that one, like I try using different keywords. And during that time, I I want to say I think I was going through keywords and I found like a few keywords that were like not hard to rank on, but was getting a lot of views and a. Uh, I put that keyword in and a different and I like, you know, everything that was relevant to it. And then for some reason, just over time, I was shocked when that video got so many views. And like I still get sales for that beat. Like and that beat was uploaded like years ago. So I mean, I I just think good keywords that aren't being searched. I mean that are being searched a lot but don't have a high competition, you know, you should try to like squeeze in there while it's still good and just build from that and i think that's kind of when we started doing like i started going like more in depth with the graphics mm -hmm. and i think that cover art was like pretty good like it was eye catchy and i think boozy was trending at that time so that's all organic reach a lot of people um aren't necessarily aware of how to do that but at the end of the day it's still free to do all that research but let's talk about inorganic reach um i heard you tell producer grind that you stick to pretty small daily Facebook and Instagram advertising budgets. A lot of producers mm -hmm. I talked to, I, I talked to a producer last night who was asking, 
if he should spend hundreds of dollars a day um, mm. because, you know, the more you spend, the more conversions you get. I said, from my mm -hmm. experience, that's not necessarily true. And when I, when I heard you say that, I, I knew that I had to ask you about that. So, um, you know, what, what is your ad strategy and why do you keep your daily budget so low? Facebook, the thing I've learned about Facebook is if you give them a large budget, they're going to run through that budget. And a lot of the views you might get might not be real. And it might not be organic people. And that's kind of why I keep the YouTube stuff like real. I mean, the Facebook like ads real low. Just because, you know, from our past, we tried Facebook and we were trying to just do like non-pixel ads. And our views would like boost up, our likes would boost up. But at the end of the day, we weren't converting sales. So that's why I keep it strictly pixel ads when we do ads on Facebook and I keep it a low budget because, you know, if I've already got the audience for them to find. I just want to keep it at a steady pace and not let them just blow through my budget showing the same ads to people that I don't know it's kind of weird. It's kind of just it's I don't know how like I just learned from the first time, like, don't don't throw all your dollars in one bucket and hope for the best, you know try to like be try to set limits and test what works for for you but for us it was like a hundred dollars you know what i'm saying um and also for like the youtube stuff you know if you branch out with other people and connect with like bigger youtube you youtubers and let them use your content you know that's a good way to build your youtube and stuff like that your fan base and i i think that helped a lot but also now that b stars has like the you know, you could download a beat for free, but you need to subscribe to somebody. That actually is good. I wouldn't recommend like doing it consistently for every beat, but like every now and then just throw that in there. And it, it's a good way to help like boost up your fan base and like get more subscribers. Another thing that you told Producer Grind that stood out is that you use social media to give something back to your followers rather than, um, at, you know, ask of something like, buy this beat, here's a beat, mm -hmm. listen to my beat, mm -hmm. buy the beat again. What does that mean to your brand and giving something to the people? If you help an artist out, they're more than likely to come look for, look to you for guidance or just might look up to you and in return you'll like gain a loyal fan, a loyal customer. If you have a loyal fan, every time you drop something, they're going to like it, they're going to comment it. Or they're, they're going to do, you know, just engaging your content and that alone is going to help boost your like uh, SEO and, you know, just get you the traffic that you want and probably you'll need eventually. You know, it all adds up to one big cause and it's to, you know, make beats and be able to do what you want to do for a living. I know there are so many marketing tools that you use, so this isn't the easiest question to answer. But out of all of them, what you know, what are maybe one or two? of the most effective marketing tools that you utilize for sure the youtube just collabing with other uh other uh youtubers like bigger youtubers that right there boosted our like subscribers up by thousands i mean it's just kind of hard to connect with somebody we just kind of got lucky and just knew a dude you know it was mark's best friend like from high school type of deal yeah. and like that shit was just organic and it just happened so you just had benefit. a famous YouTuber friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like we got like one funny video from like back then before he like actually blew up and it was like oh, the best the paper being towel. dumb. Yeah. Like he would just randomly do like funny skits and like, you know, everybody has potential to blow up. Mm -hmm. It's just if you stick to it, like he stuck to it and we stuck to it. Like now look at him. He got fucking... His got, like, both his five hundred thousand subscribers, but he got two YouTube, so yeah. it's like oh, yeah, close yeah, yeah. to like nine hundred thousand mm -hmm. followers. I mean subscribers. So we just got you know kind of got lucky, but I wouldn't. I don't know. It just it all worked out for its best, and everybody did their part to be where they're at. So that's how that happened. Um, and then I think Facebook, um, the Facebook Pixel. And the thing about Facebook Pixel, it just really depends on how you present yourself. You know, it's always trial and error because something's going to work for a month, like really good. Then the next month, 
you're going to have to change it up and do something different. And I've had to change our ads, the way we present ourselves, like five, six times over the last year, you know, just because it gets old. And that's what I meant, like by doing graphics, you know, you always got to find something that works and, you know, you're going to have to change stuff. And that's where it comes in handy. And that way we're not constantly paying like a graphic designer to uh, do everything for us, you know, because that shit gets expensive. And that's a, you know, that comes out of your budget and ultimately what you make. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, Facebook and I guess YouTube. YouTube is like one of the biggest like places you could get like, uh, you know, like traffic. So, you know, if you're ranking in YouTube, then you're you're doing good and you really probably won't even need Facebook Pixel. So there's this perception out there that major label artists or artists with large fan bases don't license beats online. Uh, is that true in your experience? <laughs> nah, they license. Money Man licensed the uh, Unlimited license, but after that I hit him up and, you know, shout out to Money Man. You know, he ended up copying the exclusive rights, but there's nothing wrong with it. It happens, it's normal. So like buying exclusive rights is to me is personally played out just because you're going to spend so much money on a beat and then you're left with no money to do marketing and do graphics. So, you know, yeah, you're going to own rights to a beat, but your graphics are going to be shitty and nobody's going to want to even click on it. You know, your promotion is not going to be there. Like, so who's going to listen to it? So you lose out on all that money, you know, and then the producer, you know, he gets stuck with a beat that's not making no income off the back end, you know, when you sell exclusive rights, that's what you try to aim for is to make money off the back end. And if you're not, then ultimately you lose out because what they paid in the beginning, you could easily make all that back. I mean, all that with just leasing it out for the next couple of years. We recently had to buy an exclusive back from somebody because of that, mm. you know, and like within the first month, with that artist paid, we made it all back. Just from the first month of putting it back up, like we made all that back. So it's just like, now we are very picky who we sell exclusive rights to, but you know, leasing is, it's, it's the normal. It's the normal now and there's nothing wrong with it. You know, I actually recommend it. So you've had plenty of beats remade by other producers for, <laughs> for some yeah. hits, right? And um, yeah. I'm I'm not gonna really go too deep into it. We'll talk once the once the the legal matters have been resolved. But what is happening really often to producers now who are publishing beats online is that their beats are becoming hit singles without them even realizing it, or mm -hmm. collecting on the thousands of dollars generated by the success of these songs through the various um, you know royalty streams. Has this happened to you? Yeah, multiple times. I mean, it's just, honestly, as, as a producer, it's like fucking, I hate it. And it makes me, like, very disappointed. It's so much bullshit that you got to do just to get paid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the artists and the labels, and they, they're all familiar with the game. So they're like, oh, like, you know, we'll collect all the money. And then at the end, we'll lower the fuck up because we got the big budget. You know what I'm saying? We'll do anything and everything to not pay the person. You know, so there's not any way you could really prevent it besides copywriting your beats before they get stolen. But I mean, it's kind of like, from my understanding, copywriting your beat with the government takes a long ass time and probably costs the arm and a leg. Cause it's a, it's think, cheap, actually. It's really cheap. It's like you How could... much is it? Thirty dollars for a, a batch of MP3s. Cause I I know we did something recently where we had to play like close to like, I want to say like six hundred bucks. I don't know if it was to like, Expedite or something, but yeah, pretty much that's copyright your beats, man. But if you're barely starting off, like I think you mentioned it before, like I wouldn't worry about it because you don't really have a fan base. But once you get up there, like definitely try to copyright your work and have paperwork just in case anything like that was to happen but you got to be realistic if you only got 100 followers and you know 50 views on your youtube or your beats like save your time you know but if you're getting thousands and thousands and millions of views you know i would definitely consider it just because you don't know who's viewed it 
who is viewing it or who's trying to remake it. So, yeah. So have it's, you had situations like that get resolved? I'm still trying to resolve one of the cases. It was going good, but now it's kind of like up in the air. So, you know, I'm still I'm still like in high hopes that it's going to get resolved, which I'm pretty sure it will one way or another just because like it's fucking obvious and we got a decent lawyer. But I mean, yeah, it happens. There's one case where the song's not even big enough for us to do anything about it. And I mean, there's people, I found out today that there's somebody that bought our beat and selling our beat to uh, artists within their city. And they're what you would call the big artists that made their own label. Mm. So I don't know. It's, it's a lot of fuckery in the, in the industry stuff. Like, well, just selling beats in, in general. But, you know, I wouldn't trade it to do anything else this is what i like to do we're making a decent living and you know at the end of the day like it all figured itself out mark how are you feeling i'm feeling good bro he's he's a little tipsy <laughs> he's just like yeah 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 see you know me i think i'm like the more serious one of the group just because like shit like that really annoys me because all the shit that i do to try to build up the brand like Shit like that is like super disrespectful. Yeah, you know, it is like, for real. Speaking of and disrespect, it, you had a birthday recently, right? Or is that still coming up? Uh, he had his birthday. My birthday is coming up. Yeah, okay, yeah. so you're still alive after you, but that's good. I was, I was worried, man. You said you were going to Vegas, right? Mm. Did oh, you? Yeah, you yeah, went, we did went, you go to Vegas? Okay. Mark, yeah, Mark we already went. forgot. <laughs> <laughs> nah, we had a good time, man. Man, uh, we see blackout black after blackouts. Yeah. I, I suited up for the birthday. I don't know if y'all seen, but <laughs> bro, everybody saying I had the Saints Row suit on, bro. <laughs> everybody making fun of me. I had the Saints Row suit. Bro, you look like you own a casino with that suit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where do you, where do you see the online beat market in five years? I think it's gonna be like the industry standard. Honestly, I think all the producers that are coming up now, I think they're gonna be like the main ones you'll see, like what they would consider the industry producers, I think it's just going to merge and everybody that's doing like really good online will be like in a super fucking good spot. The beat selling, it's only going to get better personally for me. As people learn that you could go online and buy a beat, receive the beat, receive the paperwork and everything be done properly. I think it's headed in the right direction. But I mean, of course, with any business, there's going to be bullshit. But hey, you got to take the good with the bad. Have you used the uh, the new Beastars app yet? I still haven't because uh, I don't. Have yeah, a, no, I, I got it. Yeah, I, I think it works good, man. I, I like it. it. It makes it easier on the cool. I think it's going to make sales a lot easier to get i think it's also going to help the b star stuff like actually buying promo i think the promo for the b star stuff is going to be like stupid good to use so i i definitely think people should like watch out for that you know invest in that once it comes out and just test it out all right so last question where do people find beat demons on social media where do they find the beat catalog from beat demons bdemons.com instagram is at bdemons twitter is at bdemons and this is where all the las vegas photos have been posted to as well not all of them <laughs> <laughs> all right no comment we can't post most of them <laughs> yeah bro if y'all yeah we had a good time you didn't you didn't punch anybody right <laughs> nah not this time <laughs> okay That was my worry. (laughs) On that note, I appreciate both of you taking the time to sit down and share your experiences and your wisdom. Appreciate you, bro. Of course, much continued success to you. We'll do an interview again once all your legal issues are resolved and and you're broadcasting live from a a mansion with an infinity pool. I got you, bro.